I'm very happy to be with you on this Saturday morning to help conclude the preaching rally that has been a blessing to so many people in the Iowa area for so many years. And I'm coming to you today courtesy of the studios of Good News Productions International in Joplin, who have been so gracious to make this video so you can hear these words I'm sharing with you today on seven words that changed the world. Our text is from the book of Habakkuk, sometimes pronounced Habakkuk, and it's chapter two, verse four, which says, the just shall live by his faith. Now, let me tell you a little story about when I was 12 years of age. I was listening to the radio one day, and I listened to a program, a fiction program, about a scientist who built a time machine that would propel him back into time, thus allowing him to alter the course of history. And based on that radio script, I adapted, 12 years old, remember, a wretched bit of fiction which I placed myself in that time machine, which promptly transported me back to the year 1865. As a young admirer of Abraham Lincoln, by the way, my only son is named Lincoln in his honor, I would transcend time and history by becoming the man who was supposed to be guarding the presidential box in Ford's Theater on April 14th, 1865, that fateful night when President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Proudly, I would protect and preserve my president by thwarting the dastardly deeds of John Wilkes Booth. But alas and alack, somehow I had made a terrible error in my scientific calculations. Instead of becoming the guard, I became the assassin. With mounting horror, I felt myself being drawn to the presidential box where my beloved Lincoln sat with his wife, Mary, watching a production of Our American Cousin. With madness raging in my brain, I reached into my pocket, pulled out a revolver, pointed it at that familiar profile, and pulled the trigger. What a sad story. People have been fascinated by time machines from time immemorial. There have been three movies, I think, made on Back to the Future. My favorite is Somewhere in Time, and one of the first was one by H.G. Wells, The Time Machine. So I'm going to ask you to, this morning to join me in another time machine of sorts. I promise you this journey will be much more pleasant than the one when I was 12 years old. We are going to set the dial for 606 BC. And as we step out of our marvelous machine, we find ourselves in the Middle East, in the ancient land of Judah. A grizzled old prophet is speaking to a large group of people. He is informing them of an impending horror. They are going to be taken as prisoners to Babylon. A friendly bystander tells us the prophet's name. Habakkuk, certainly not your everyday name, even in those times. Habakkuk, we discover, means one who embraces or clings. From the look on his face, we can see that here is a man determined to cling to God no matter what happens to his beloved nation. We press our way forward until we can hear him speaking in a voice that seems to break with emotion when he writes, I will stand upon my watch and will watch to see what he, that is God, will say to me. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Isn't it interesting that buried in this obscure, neglected, nearly forgotten book of the Old Testament lies the secret to victorious, triumphant, successful Christian living. The just 
shall live by his faith. But before we can really discuss living by faith, let us get back into our time machine, reverse gears, and rocket ourselves 650 years into the future. When we disembark, we find ourselves in the New Testament era in the city of Antioch. The year is AD 49. After a brisk walk, we come to a house, we enter it, and we find a man bent over a piece of parchment. This man, unlike Habakkuk, is not obscure, is not unknown. The figure at work at the table is none other than the great apostle Paul. An assistant whispers to us that Paul is writing a circular letter to the churches in Galatia, a Roman province in Asia Minor. And the Galatians, we learn later, were a Celtic people who had originally lived in Gaul before migrating to their present surroundings. And Paul had done some missionary work among them on his first missionary journey. But now he is writing in response to a report that the Galatian churches were being troubled by not some space invaders, but some grace invaders, certain Jews who professed faith in Christ, but were seeking to impose the Mosaic law upon new Gentile converts. We realize Paul is now writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so we do not want to disturb him, but we do manage a peek over his shoulder as his quick moving quill spells out these words. O oh, foolish Galatians, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by his faith. Galatians 3, 1 and verse 11. So from the earliest stage of Paul's writings, the stage is now set. Christianity is a religion that is to be lived by faith. But what does that mean? We are not quite ready for a discussion of that yet. However, if you are willing, we are ready to take another ride in our marvelous time machine. And I do hope you are not prone to travel sickness like I was a boy when I was a child. But this journey will be a brief one, only seven years into the future now. The year is AD 56, and the city is the magnificent Mediterranean metropolis of Corinth. And once again, we find ourselves in the lodgings of the great apostle Paul. And once again, he is writing, this time to Christians who reside in the city of Rome, the eternal city. Somehow we sense that this letter will be Paul's greatest work, the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. For indeed, the book of Romans gives us the most systematic presentation of Christian doctrine in the entire Bible. We are amazed and delighted when we see Paul, who has barely begun this wonderful work, write the following lines in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by his faith. Isn't this amazing? The great apostle Paul quoting the obscure prophet Habakkuk now twice. And we're not done yet. <laughs> A quick spin of the dial in our time machine takes us to the year A.D. 69. And suddenly we find ourselves in the presence of the writer of Hebrews. No one knows who wrote Hebrews. The standard answer has been only God knows. Some think it was Paul. Some think it was Barnabas. Some think it was Apostle. But whoever he was and wherever he was when he wrote this letter, he is writing to a group of very discouraged Christians, converted Hebrews, who because of persecution are now actually contemplating and thinking about 
abandoning their new Christian faith and returning to life under the Mosaic law. So with bold strokes, the author of Hebrews writes, Do not cast away your confidence, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by his faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That's in your Bible, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35, 37 through 38. Now, can you stand two more trips? They are really long ones, but they're very necessary excursions into understanding what it means to live by faith. So from AD 62, we are going to go all the way to AD 1512. When we get out of our marvelous time machine, we find an emaciated 27-year-old priest sitting in his cold and lonely tower cell in a monastery known as the Black Cloister. We are now in Wittenberg, Germany. The young man is weary of trying to gain favor with God by works. And today, this man has chosen to read Paul's letter to the Romans. And he is barely into the epistle when he comes across the words that seem to actually glow in the gloom of his cell. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by his faith. Martin Luther could barely believe what he had just read. Faith, that is how he should live, by faith. Oh, how very, very simple. And Martin Luther would never be the same, and nor would Germany or Europe or America, indeed, the entire world. One more final trip in our time machine, and I would think by this time it's due for an oil change, don't you? <laughs> this time we are going to go back to the future. And the time is now, April 6th, A.D. 2024, in the state of Iowa, in the city of Ottumwa. A man, a woman, a boy, a girl, sits in church, Christ Church at River Road, and hears a preacher quote Habakkuk 2.4, and then three more quotations from the New Testament, and you've already heard them, Galatians 3.11, Romans 1.17, Hebrews 10.38. And then the worshiper, and it might be you, hears a voice asking this question. Do you know what it means to live by faith? And are you living by faith? It's not the voice of a prophet. It's not the voice of an apostle. It's not the voice of a monk. It is the voice of your own conscience. You see, the Christian life is faith from beginning to end. Paul asked the Galatians in Galatians 3 and verse 2, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, it was by faith, naturally, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. I can attest to this. In this great state of Iowa, on June 22, 1958, at Pine Lake Bible Camp near Eldora, Iowa, is when I gave my life to Christ. I stood on the shores of Pine Lake and said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because I'd heard the Word of God all my life, first of all from my father, Dale V. Knowles, and many other stalwarts of the faith, some of them whose names you will recognize this morning, Donald G. Hunt, Archie Word, Jerry Weller, Leif Culver, and many, many others who preached that the Christian life is, as Paul said, from faith to faith, 
from beginning to end. And so it was that by the grace of God, I was saved by faith. Because the Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. By the grace of God, someday I will die in faith. Because the Bible speaks of others who said, these all died in faith. And precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And that's the way I want to die. In other words, we enter this Christian life by faith and we exit this Christian life by faith. But what comes in between being saved by faith and dying in the faith? Surely it's not just existing, but rather we should be exulting and experiencing and enjoying the Christian life. All this is to say we need to live by faith. At the end of World War I, 1918, James Wells wrote this song, and it's familiar to many of you. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, if shadows or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, so all of my worries are vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love, from all harm safe in his sheltering arms. I'm living by faith and feel no alarms. After the fall of Berlin in 1945, the body of an old Jewish man was found in a bombed out basement. With a bit of chalk, he had managed to scrawl on the wall these words. I believe in God. Even when the sun is not shining. You see, faith is being loyal to God in either fortune or failure. Faith like this is illustrated in the lives of three biblical characters. Although Job, the patriarch Job, lost nearly all his earthly possessions, including his children, he managed to say, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This man's faith knew no bounds. He said, though God slay me, yet I trust in him. And then long, long before the cross and the empty tomb, Job cried out in total faith, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And after my body is destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall, shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another." And then there is the great Apostle Paul, who I believe is the greatest Christian who ever lived. I hope to write a book about his life someday. Paul, like Job, suffered much, but not so much that he failed to practice what he preached, to live by faith. Listen to his testimony as the sands of time ran out for him. 2 Timothy 1.12 For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed until that day. William Barclay, the great Scottish scholar and preacher, notes, we must always remember that Paul does not say he knew what he had believed, as important as that is. His certainty did not come from intellectual knowledge of a creed or theology. It came from a personal knowledge of God. Finally, there is the man we started out with in this chapter, Habakkuk. Remember that we said his name meant one who embraces or clings? Now, notice how determined he is to cling to God no matter what happens. Remember, Judah is about to be carried into captivity. And yet Habakkuk, the man who first gave us the concept of the seven 
words that can change the world, the just shall live by his faith, can say these words in Habakkuk chapter 3, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior, for the sovereign Lord is my strength. And that's what it means to live by faith. May God help you to rejoice in the Lord always, as Paul said, and he wrote this from prison, and again, I will say, rejoice. God bless you.